Welcome friendlies to Lunching with Lawyers. Today I'm on the south coast of New South Wales in Malua Bay interviewing Kimberly Myart. Is that right, Kimberly? That's correct, Kimberly, <laughs> Kimberly Myart. <laughs> A Belgian law graduate. She speaks four languages, yes, four of them, Flemish, English, French, and a bit of German. Um, she immigrated to Australia in 2019. Not quite what she was expecting to do, but COVID happened. She now resides in on the south coast of New South Wales, where she has four jobs, four languages, four jobs, <laughs> uh, teaching uh, yoga, uh, teaching children to surf, working in a women's refuge and a job in hospitality. None of these roles I suspect require a law degree. Since leaving Belgium some years ago, she's written a blog of her travels at kimmyisdenbushen.com. They'll be, I'll make sure that we put that in the show notes and you can check her out on that blog. Let's discover why the change in career and how her law degree has shaped her life. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you, Loretta, for having me here in Malua Bay. <laughs> it's lovely. And uh, Kimberly, before we start, I thought I'd talk to you about something that we Australians probably find really strange, and that's somebody who can speak four languages. How do those Europeans do it? You're, you're just so good at it and we're not. So what is the secret? I think it's just very common for us because we already start to learn different languages at a very young age in um, primary school. So at about age 11, we start to learn French. Um, and then when we're like 13 years old, um, we start to learn English and German. And it's just because... Um, for example, here, when you drive two hours, you'll be in Canberra. When we drive two hours, we'll be in a different country. So Belgium is surrounded by um, our neighboring countries are the Netherlands and England and Germany. So that's why it's very common for us to speak multiple languages. And in Belgium, it's very common that, to, that people speak both um, Dutch. Flemish is a dialect of Dutch and French. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me how you can do it. And and I was going to then ask you, Kimberly, what made you pursue a law degree? Did you always want to be a lawyer? No, I actually, when I was a child, I always thought I was going to be a nurse or a doctor. Um, and then when I was uh, 16 years old, we had to do a, a dream day for high school, and which was like going on a day with um, one of our friends that was um, doing the profession that we really wanted to participate in, in in a later stage in our lives, like our dream profession. And for me, that was a lawyer. So um, I was babysitting at um, a lawyer's children and I was like, oh, I want to go. I think I want to I want to study law and I think I want to become a lawyer. And then I went with him to court in the morning and then to his office in the afternoon to go through all the files and to... Um, to prepare the lawsuits and I was like yes this is what I want to do and I love talking <laughs> so and I, I also play theater so it was yeah it's always a bit of it's, theater it's in the court it's a performance and I like performing still <laughs> yeah and and you went to Ghent University yes where's that place so Ghent um is it was about 30 minutes from my home so i live in between ghent and antwerp so it's in the mm -hmm. flemish part of belgium so you've got the northern part of brussels is the flemish part and then south of brussels you've got wallonie which is like the the, the french part yeah so for me it was pretty obvious to go to ghent because it was um i could choose for antwerp or for again but i think ghent was in the east flanders part mm. and i'm from east flanders and so what language was your university course taught? Dutch, in? yeah. Dutch. So in, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I only done, done like a few um, subjects in English. They were like international criminal law and that was with Erasmus students. So that's like an overseas ex exchange program. I've done that too. I've done an, um, a five-month exchange program in Slovenia, Ljubljana, which was like completely in English. And yeah, but most of it was... <laughs> I couldn't imagine trying to do a university course in another language that would be really difficult <laughs> and so you chose that mainly because it was close to where you were living that university 
Yeah, and also a few of my friends were going there, and yeah, I didn't, um, yeah, I just knew, knew a few people that were going to Ghent University. Does that mean so, you got to live at home while you were at university? I, um, I lived at home mainly, um, but for one year I, I, I lived in Ghent, so I shared house with to people and then I just yeah I was close to uni then but it didn't I didn't really have to it was like 30 minutes on the train so I could easily <laughs> yeah I could easily go to uni but it was like very cool to live in your in Dutch it's called cot <laughs> which is just like yeah yeah your house like it's called like your shed <laughs> or <Yeah>. something <laughs> just sharing house and it was like oh and we can go party and <laughs> yeah well, why you know? not <laughs> now I st- though this system in law in Australia is completely different to that in Belgium yeah. because we have a common law, we're a common law country, while Belgium's legal system is um, based on a civil law philosophy or, or system. I'm interested in hearing what some of the practical differences are in the two systems. And before we started this interview, you were telling me about how a typical criminal law case might run in Belgium and I was wondering whether you could tell me about it like tell me how somebody who might be charged with a um, criminal offence what the process might be for them that they go through. Yeah for example um, in a criminal case let's just say a drug case or something then you um, you will be brought before the just called the correctional court, <laughs> um, and depending on the severity of the of the case, if it would be like an an organized crime, it would be come in front of three judges, and otherwise it would be a sole magistrate. Um, and it is true that in civil law countries, the judge really has a role as an investigator. So the trial will start with like the judge giving a bit of a brief resume of the. The, the facts of the case and then doing an interrogation of the perpetrator so not an interrogation of the lawyer but an interrogation of the perpetrator starting with like what's your name and date of birth that's the first question always mm-hmm. and then just like, like yeah things that they've when they prepared their file because they don't always have time to prepare their files but they would have like a list of questions to ask to them and then right after that inter- interrogation has happened then the victim or the victim's lawyer because usually people will be represented in court they don't always have to but usually they will be and then they will just um they will give an a bit of a resume of the facts but they can't really talk about the criminal aspect of the case they can just ask for their compensation which is like um even calculated in some kind of way. For example, if they have like an injury that um, that results in not being able to work or like being 50% um, yeah, like a disability yeah. to work, then it will be like according to official um, legislation how they have to cal- calculate their compensation. So they can't... And what yeah, about if they can't pay the perpetrator? What that happens? happens a lot. Well, then they will in generally... There is like a fund... Um, this is the fund for um, victims of um, crimes of aggression yeah. and then they can submit like an application with them so there's for, for example I've in my in my job in the women's refuge I've, I've assisted quite a few times now with a victim services application so it's mm. something similar like that yeah and then they but can do that it's conflated like it's joined whereas in in Australia there's a criminal case and then there might be a civil case to They work can out sometimes it will come together at first and then in bigger cases they can like um, order the judge can order a court calendar and then which will be like you have to everything needs to be in writing first so both parties and even the public prosecutor who, who is a separate party will get like a set, set date to submit their written conclusions mm-hmm. we call them i'm not sure what the term, terminology yeah, for that is in submissions yes yeah. submissions and then there will be um set a date for the first hearing and then the the pleadings will happen and sometimes after the criminal part of the case has been that's always prior then they can set the case to a later date for the um it's called like the resolution of the of the civil aspect of the case or yeah mm. yeah but so they thought, yeah. yeah they can do it together 
it's yeah it's yeah. really different it's uh, this, the problem is that i don't have anything to compare it but i'm really triggered i want to go to court here to see how it's like and just to see all the differences well, as, long as, you're not, as, long as, as long as you're not the um perpetrator yeah no 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 just to see for example one of my colleagues at the women's refuge she works for um uh wdv cast for women's domestic violence court advocacy um, service and i was like hey can i go to court with you just to see as yeah just like to observe the court system because that i think that would mm. be really but like in smaller cases for example if it's like a, a burglary or anything that then it can be everything can be just um all um handled in, in the same on the same court hearing and the after the judges um or the judge interrogates um the perpetrator then the victim will ask for compensation and then they will give the the floor <laughs> to the public prosecutor the mm. public prosecutor will ask for the sentence like for example five years or whatever or you have to do like um community service or anything like that um and then it um it's the it's the pleadings of the perpetrator and then they might follow like a, an um, an answer um replica <laughs> something <laughs> replica yeah, yeah. <laughs> just using my terminology but it's probably incorrect anyway i'll find no. out later <laughs> yeah, sure about it. yeah so i was it's... going to ask you though because before we started this you were saying a little bit about it's not actually police that in they must investigate the crimes yeah police just... police always investigates the crime but the majority of um of well, all cases will be always investigated by um, by police, but then there's it can go two ways. If the perpetrator is held longer than twenty four hours, they need to show in front of they need they need to yeah rep, be represented in front of a judge. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just they will be released within twenty four hours, and then the investigation goes further. And the head of the investigation will be the public prosecutor. While if they're um, in prison for longer than 24 hours, they have to, before, um, right before that 24 hours ends, they have to go to court in front of a judge, will be interrogated again. And then the judge can decide if they will be released in a way, waiting for their trial, or if they can be imprisoned longer, which is pre-trial, which is like, there is still the, um, uh, what is it called? So like, a little, little bit like our bail system where we go. Yes, because then, then the mm. judge can release them on bail with like conditions, like you have to keep your job, you cannot... Um, get any clothes yeah, you have to leave the victim alone or like more or you have to follow an aggression course or like go to rehab stuff like that otherwise in very severe cases they will be brought within if the judge decides it's not you're going to stay in prison they will have to um go to a hearing before in french it's called like la, la chambre du conseil so it's like oh, the that's chamber. That's so beautiful. Can you say that again? <laughs> La Chambre du Conseil. <laughs> so like the the chamber of the council, which is like um, a courtroom, and they can mm. imprison you for another thirty days, and then you have to, yeah. <laughs> and then you might. Then you have to re um, reappear again yeah. before that same so, courtroom or you can go into appeal before la chambre des mises en accusation <laughs> which is the chamber of um accusation yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. it yeah. sounds so lovely but there's not many jury trials is there in in belgium oh there's he and yeah, not, there's, there's not, he, oh there's yeah. lots yeah and it takes it can it can take a very long time it can take up to like two years before your your case is tried so it's if just, you're if you're waiting for two years. Does that mean every thirty days you have to appear? Before yes, before yes, a yeah. judge. Well, as long as you're held in, if yeah. you're imprisoned. Yes. But it can be, it can work both ways, really. So I had, when I was in my second year intern, as an intern, I actually had a um, pretty rough case. I would call it my my, my, my most rough or my roughest case Is ever. Yeah, um, toughest, toughest, yeah. Toughest, toughest, yeah. Um, and that was um, my my lawyer i mean the, the lawyer that i was working for like oh kim can you go to prison because we have this new client and i went to prison and i went to 
to the courtroom first to have a look into the file because that's what we do. And yeah. then it was like a very severe pedophile case. Yeah. Anyway, um, in one of the first hearings, the judge actually decided I came up with like an, a, a plan to go to some kind of um, counseling specifically for mm. sexual uh, perpetrators. Yeah. And they released him. Um, mm. They released him on bail. It took him two years to go to get to his trial where he got in prison for 10 years. So he was mm. like free for two years and then he got mm. in prison for 10 years, which was, in my opinion, like a bit, yeah, yeah. out of balance. But yes. yeah, that's just how the, co the court system works. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it was a very severe, so yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say mm. anything like it, it's not the right. So when you say that you weren't happy, uh, when you think it was out of balance, it was more because the process took so long. It took so long um, and then because that person not, well, I was his I was his lawyer, but not defending what he's what the yeah. fact because it was quite horrible. Um, but yeah, that person was like working, was going to therapy weekly, and then they come in front of like a different court that doesn't know anything further about the person that just mm -hmm. opens a file once and says like, "Oh my God, this is horrible! Look at those pictures! Look at what he's done!" Yeah. Yeah. Up to jail too for 10 years now. <laughs> and do they have the same sort of parole system in Belgium? Like, yeah. So that you can, we might get a sentence of 10 years, but it doesn't necessarily yes. mean that they'll yeah. serve 10 years. No, no, that's the same. So after you, mm. you get in front of a different court then, which yeah. is for the execution of the, of the sentence, but in with sexual assault crimes, it'll be usually two thirds of the sentence and unless it has changed because it's been three years since I've practiced yeah. but for like other crimes it'll be after one one third of your sentence you have the, the possibility the option to like play before that um it's not even it's not always even in front of the court to get released earlier yeah. but um for sexual crimes it's, it's double yeah Two yeah. thirds. Yeah, two thirds. So in Australia, before practicing as a lawyer, you have to, um, you have to, you need to obtain a university degree, undertake practical legal training course, and then seek admission to practice. What's the process in Belgium? Is it similar? Yeah. So we um, we study our law degree for five years, so three years of bachelor in law, and then two mm. years of masters in law. It used to be like um, it was like a, a major my um, master in law with like option to study criminal law or whatever. In the end, it, it they they abolished that system, and you can just specialize yourself by picking mo most of the subjects in your mayor. And I did mostly criminal law and family law and then after that um you have to go to court and say uh the oath yes, <laughs> like, is that yes. before you do your practical that's before legal? your practical legal training uh -huh. yeah so yeah. your practical legal training is pretty much working for three years in a law firm for another lawyer or just like you can even work for just one lawyer in mm -hmm. a little office you can't work um completely for yourself but you will be after one year you will automatically get pro bono cases um and then yeah they, they and just what do like you mean by pro bono cases you legal can aid do, yeah legal well, aid. you can work for legal you can do, take on legal aid cases. yes only after a mm. year because you have practical legal training and the which is three years for us so 36 months the first 12 months of that you have to go to evening school as well and you have to do extra um, separate examinations for like your capacity to practice as a lawyer it's called but on the, it's for me it's sometimes a bit difficult to understand because from day one after i did done my oath before the, the court of appeal we were allowed to go to 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 defend yeah, yeah to court and to defend so and then you just come straight out of university where you think like oh i've learned so much i've got all these knowledge then and then you come in front of the judge and like yeah but do you, and then the judge said, do you know do you know how the system works here and i'm like um i don't know <laughs> my boss has just sent me with this spa <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's very awkward at the start <laughs> so you're literally thrown in the deep end but i to be honest i did like it because i've learned heaps from like mm, being thrown in the being deep thrown end. in the deep end and awkward situations but, it, but that would be very stressful 
It was, yeah. And you get also like a minimum wage. It's like, oh, it was just ridiculous. So for the first three years you get a, a minimum, minimum wage. wage. Yeah. And when you talk about a minimum wage, what is it as a percentage of what you would be getting as a as a um, graduate? Like once you've... Once you maybe a third or something, yeah, third, or, or less yeah. even, because I remember the first year I got something which was about two grand, but it was before tax, so we had we were very heavily taxed. So that was two thousand a month. Two, yes, two thousand a month, uh, a, month mm. a month, yeah. yeah. So that's so. like five hundred a week, but before tax. Yeah. So and then you have to think there's at least like thirty. 30% that goes off it <laughs> or 40 yes. even. Yeah. It was, it was absolutely ridiculous. You can't, you can't survive with, without having a partner or you really have to stay at home with your parents doing that. Now they put it up a little bit. So it's, but it's still not, it's, it's still, not enough well, because how old were you then when you were starting? I was, to so I graduated Yeah, 23 when I started. Yeah. And you want to be living on your own. You yeah, and I was I was home. living on my I had a I had a boyfriend at the time in Belgium and I was living with him together and mm. I was lucky because he was working as well and he, he would pay like most of the like I would pay half of the rent and we were we were having very cheap rent, but he would pay for most of the amenities like water and electricity. But yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't really enough for you to live out of no. home on your own. No. No, because I've spent a lot of my savings and my parents were like, where did all your savings go? And I'm like, well, I can't, I mean, it's, it's, I get better money to just not work, <laughs> get like a, a government allowance or something which is, is comparable to like a central link. So, <laughs> instead it's, of so it would be more than, yes, more than what you were doing. it would be more and instead of slaving for it because you're, you're an intern, so yeah, that's it's typical. And and even my colleague said, yes, you're the intern, so you're getting all the, sh the shit files now. <laughs> Just, excuse my language, but it no. is true. <laughs> it's true. So, well, it was a bit like that with, in Australia as well before we had practical legal training and we did what's called articles, or you could do articles instead, and sometimes people were paid very poorly for that work because they were seen as really training and the firms were providing the training for free in a sense. Yeah. Um, so what was your first job upon graduating and how did you get that job? So I really wanted to be like, I'm going to be a criminal lawyer. <laughs> so I looked up the top 10 of criminal lawyers in Belgium. Yeah. And um, one of them was um, a lawyer in, in a, a female lawyer in, in, in the town Alst, which was pretty close to my home. And I just rode to that firm and I got like a job, job interview and I got the job straight away. It wasn't really hard to get in. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to do all this criminal law. <laughs> but then I also had to do family law. So I got trained in like divorces mm -hmm. and, um, and I've done a bit of immigration law as well as asylum cases. But yeah, I've learned, mm -hmm. I've learned a lot in that firm because that was, um, I really got thrown in the deep end there and I was, they allocated files to you and you're going to do the file from the start till the end. So even mm -hmm. the intake with the, with the client. So that was really, so I really got, liked that. That's really interesting yeah. because how many lawyers were employed at that firm? Um, in, I think 15 up to 20. We were yeah. like for, for our little jurisdiction, um, we were one of the bigger firms. Firm. Because yeah. in some places, particularly when you're very junior like that, they don't let you go anywhere near the clients. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so. They didn't do that at that firm. And and, and it was still mm. like I've, I um I had friends that were doing the same internship and they were they were like a bit jealous, like, oh and you are allowed to go to court, you're allowed to go to jail, um, to have like yeah, um in yeah, conversations with the client, meetings with the clients mm. in jail when they were in prison. So yeah. That's really um, good. So you were practicing family criminal and migration, yep. but you were saying before that they don't have domestic violence because you did say you worked in a women's refuge yep. in Australia. You said in Belgium they don't have domestic violence orders. So what happens if some if a if a partner assaults their partner in the family home? Do they just get charged with a criminal offence? Yeah, most of yeah they yeah. just get charged and they have to wait until the court case until. In um, if it's like um, an inter um, very severe, like an attempted yeah. murder, then they would 
either already be in prison and have to go in front of that judge and in front of that chambre du conseil. Um, and then the judge can like, if they would release him in or her <laughs> before trial, then they can like put a, yeah, on bail, like a condition, mm. like you, you can't come any... Where, but it's not, there's not a, an, a separate legal instrument like the the AVO here, which I found really interesting because I started at the women's refuge and they were like talking about yeah AVO here and I was like what is an AVO and they were like looking at me seriously Kim I thought you were a lawyer <laughs> I was like yes but I, I'm a lawyer from Belgium you know, <laughs> you know? I always have thought of, <laughs> I I have always thought of that as very strange not ever having practiced in any of those areas of criminal law or in domestic, uh, with domestic violence. But I've always thought it strange that it was okay to assault someone and then get a domestic violence order on AVO and sort of get a second chance. Whereas if you assaulted anyone in not an intimate partner relationship, yeah, you'd be charged with a criminal offence. So yes, that's it's... actually discrimination. We have yeah, the constitutional mm. court would like rule on that. That 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 would actually be very mm. interesting in Belgium because that would maybe cause like a major issue. It would be seen as discrimination. discrimination. Yeah, it's discriminatory. Mm. Yeah, if I because about it. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, the majority of people who are going to be victims of um, and assault a domestic, in a domestic setting is likely to be women. So, yeah, you're right. I've always thought that was very strange. So um, it's interesting. And do you think then that's a better system of dealing with domestic violence in Belgium? Mm, mm. Not really. I, I actually like the, the AVO um, system. I just don't know Why? if it's if it's like... It, is it like Belgium that it takes you two, three years to go to your actual trial? Or is it faster in Australia? That's something interesting, interesting question that I want to find out. I've recently, in my job in the re Women's Refuge, I'm trying to also follow all these legal <laughs> little legal trainings, like about mm. the family court and like yeah. um, how it all changed recently to find out more about the procedure. And it seems like it's, it's a bit more efficient here than in Belgium, I would say, but I haven't seen it in practice. I've only seen it on paper, so yeah. maybe it's Same. not true. <laughs> maybe it's as inefficient as Belgium. <laughs> now, I, I'm going to become very petty about and um, talk about fashion. <laughs> you have to wear a special gown to go to court in Belgium. Yes, we do. Which we can wear as well in Australia, but most people don't. Only sometimes barristers do, but not all the time. It's not a requirement any longer. But what I thought was interesting is that you're not supposed to post a picture of yourself in your gown on social media. Yes. Is that true? Yeah, it's true because of ethics. Addicts and like and the code of conduct we have to follow as a lawyer. But I yeah, I only posted I think at the like the last month of my career because I was like I'm gonna quit, <laughs> which is very naughty. But no, you're not supposed to do that. Even like because we're also not supposed to talk to the press too much. Um, and with major murder cases, uh, yeah, the television would be all over it and like film you or photograph you, and mm. if, and then it is your duty to be a good lawyer is to not be photographed or to not be filmed in your in your gown in, in your gown yeah mm. that's very interesting because i think we have a different uh relationship with the media or we can because we do want to have those stories out there about the job that we do it can be a very positive thing to show that lawyers are doing a good job and upholding the system of justice, that it's not about getting people off, it's about being part of that process so that people don't go to jail without having someone to defend them and look after their interests as well. Mm. It's supposed to be for equality because you can't see your um, clothing then and then everybody is equal in front of the courtroom. That's the idea that's behind it, but yeah can still wear Louboutins on the wrist and then it's not really equal or sneakers. I don't think you, you're not very much Louis Vuitton in, in Malua Bay, are you? I'm not. <laughs> um, how long did you stay at that firm? 
for five years. So yes, mm. I, my whole my whole look, short career. <laughs> is that is that pretty common that most people go to one position and stay in mm. Belgium, or are they moving a bit more now? Uh they. Yeah, it depends. I've I've um I've had intern friends that changed for three times during their internship or like went to a completely different firm afterwards or went to work for the government or but yeah there's there's quite a few people that stay for the same, same firm and I think like why would you change if you like where you're at because it's it's so you it's liked tricky. it you yeah liked I did it. You yeah, loved yeah, it, yeah but you quit why I did quit um because I got the end of 2017 I got really stressed out um, I was also like a little gym junkie, so I used to go to CrossFit sometimes twice a day. I was putting a lot of pressure on myself, and there was a lot of pressure, obviously, in my role as a lawyer. And I, I was 28, and I, I really burned out, um, which I find pretty embarrassing at the time because I was like, oh my god, I'm 28 years old. I should, I should just continue on go, 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 because that's how, what you're supposed to do when you're a lawyer and keep on going. But all of a sudden. I couldn't go anymore and then yeah I had a break from it but I decided to return to the law firm once I felt better I started with just a few days a week first and then got back to a full time I felt completely better my career was pretty much thriving at the moment as well because mm-hmm. I've done a lot of on it's called the on-call system for lawyers to be present during police interrogation or during interrogation before that particular judge that decides on imprisonment mm-hmm. or not um yeah and it was always going really well but I just asked myself the question really is this really what my life is supposed to look like I can do this for another 30 years if I want to I think I want to live a little bit more and I was I was like 29 at that stage and I had friends that done the working holiday in Australia that you have to apply for before you're 30 and they had great experiences and I was like I want to see the world so I quit the end of 18 and three months later I was on a plane to Bali to practice yoga because during (laughs) (laughs) during my, my burnout I also found the joy of yoga at first as a bit of a recommendation from my doctor and I was like oh my god I'm not going to go to yoga I want to lift heavy heavy weights in the gym <laughs> I don't want to go uh, chant om or whatever but it really helped me and I, I done like my teacher training and then I went to Bali so you did you started a shtanga though yes in, which is in Belgium in Belgium while which, I, which is a hard practice. which is the hardest practice so during my burnout like after when I was like two months at home or something, I started going to Ashtanga yoga, which is pretty much the still the hardest version of yoga. <laughs> but I always like a challenge, I think. And yeah, I I got really um, I really liked it, and it gave me like good mindfulness as well, even while it was hard. Uh, mm. and yeah, I got a lot of benefits from it, and then I decided to go to fly to Bali to practice a bit more of Ashtanga yoga. But you were planning on staying in Australia, were No, you? I was initially, I told all my friends, yeah, I'm just, and also the law firm, I said, I'm going to go for 18 months, I just need a break, I want to live, I want to travel. I spent four months in Asia, so two months in Bali, and then I went to Malaysia and Vietnam as well, and then I decided, all right, I'm going to go to Australia now, and I found a job as an au pair, as a nanny, <laughs> which is also which, completely which is very, which very is, different, but I was like, why not? Which is not? very typical for... <laughs> yeah, for a backpacker that is 20 years old, not when you're 30, but anyway, <laughs> I did it. <laughs> but um, I was going to go back, you stopped in Bali on your way to Australia, yes. and I, I heard you use your lawyer skills early on. <laughs> yes. What was the issue? Oh, so yeah, I, um, I was actually... I went to Bali for the first time in 2017 um, and that was before I got really like connected with yoga and I found this little studio and I just remembered that they were teaching Ashtanga yoga up there that that was something that I remembered later mm-hmm. on. So I went to Bali before coming to Australia in 2019 and I just subscribed for a course there and I had to pay like a couple of hundred dollars through PayPal. It was American. Mm-hmm. Uh dollars and I went to the first class and uh, it was absolutely horrible in my opinion it was just like 30 or 40 people squ- 
squished in together like sardines in that same little room. The teacher was a substitute, so it wasn't the initial teacher mm. that I wanted to go practice with. And it was just, I just really didn't feel it. And I was like, oh, I, I've spent all this money and I don't know what to I do. I <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and I want to go somewhere else. What do I do? So um, that night I went out for dinner and I, um, I, I met with another yoga teacher and she was like, you got to speak your truth, she said. So I wrote the um, Ashtanga yoga teacher a very lawyerish email, <laughs> <laughs> like setting out all my arguments, <laughs> defending myself, and I got my money back. So, I was... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you also then had a run in with your insurance company, didn't you? Yes. Oh, uh, so yeah, I've I signed up for like the highest or the best policy from an Allianz travel insurance and um I signed up for it two days before I went on the mm. plane, but I didn't pay for it until a month after and I woke up in the middle of the night like oh I still need to pay that policy I already felt a bit funny as well a couple of days later I got into the hospital with acute appendicitis in Bali so if I wouldn't have had that travel insurance I would just be I think back on the plane to Belgium to pay all my debts because the I went to the Bali International Hospital and for one night it was 950 American dollars um, yeah. for just one night and I spent five uh, nights in that hospital plus the surgery and like all the x-rays mm. so it would have ruined me financially so yeah, thank you Allianz for protecting me <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what to go is now with insurance policies with all oh, COVID yes. oh, gee, be terrible. <laughs> so you came to Australia that would have been in the middle of 2019 was it? July 2019, yes. So I started traveling. I got on the plane specifically the 8th of April 19 and the end of July I was in Australia to, at the Gold Coast, at Tweed Heads actually. So I, I flew to the Gold Coast and to be a nanny for a couple of months with a really um, nice family. And um, why did you, you'd always plan to only stay there a few months or were you planning on staying I was, there longer? I was planning on staying in Australia for a year to do mm. just that one year visa. And I was actually going to stay a bit longer in Asia. So, um, but what happened was I signed up for, um, through, I think, I don't know, like trusted, trusted house sitters.com was the app. Uh, and I signed it up for house sitting in Vietnam which yeah. was initially only going to be for three weeks, like watching a dog for three weeks while, the, while mm. the owner was away in Canada. And then she asked me if I wanted to extend it to six weeks. And I said yes, before realizing that it was in Ho Chi Minh City, like Saigon, busy city, 45 mm. degrees, uh, traffic all over and mm. completely not what makes my heart really happy. Um, yeah. And I was there for just, yeah. And that was, I was like, that's it. I'm going to Australia now to the beach. So I started looking online for jobs and I didn't really know what to do. And then I find just like on, on, on seek or something, I found dream nannies. I was like, Oh, I could be a nanny. And then I found this really found this really nice description of a family that was into yoga, into surfing, and I always wanted to learn how to surf. I couldn't with my acute appendicitis, unfortunately. <laughs> but I was like, oh, that's the go. I'm just gonna sign up for this. I think I'll I'll connect with this family, and they became really good friends. Yeah. Obviously. And so you learned to surf on the Gold Coast. Yes, I started there in a mm -hmm. female surf school, and then here down at the South Coast. So, what you, drew you to the Eurobadama here on the South Coast? Oysters. Oh, oysters. <laughs> well, yeah. tell me more, Kimberly. Tell me yeah. more. <laughs> yes. So during. Um, after being a couple of months in Australia, I was like, oh, I want to be here for a bit longer. So what you have to do then on a working holiday visa to extend it is do your 77 uh, days or is it eight, 88. No, 88, 77, <laughs> no, I came up, 88 days. Oh my God, even more horrendous farm days. And, um, mm -hmm. you can go blueberry picking under the 50 Celsius degrees, beautiful sunshine in mm -hmm. the field. Or I just started to do some research and I found out that you can also work in oysters and that that attracted me because i was like i still live near the beach mm. and i'll still be able to continue surfing so i contacted an oyster farmer 
down the south coast and it's really funny because I, I became really good friends with his wife now after words because we I mean we weren't friends because of that but at that time the bushfires were going on crazy and I, I honestly didn't have a clue because I was in Coffs Harbour working in a surf camp that was so was when, my, when did you come down here um right after the fires so the end of mm. January 2020 yes. yeah right after the bushfires it was still burning down Maruya and the sky was dusty and I was like oh mm. Yes. yes, because the oyster farmer actually said, I'm sorry, Kimberly, but I don't think I will have work for you because we're just going crazy here. Because I started like calling him a few days after New Year's and that was just the apocalypse yeah. here, really. And then um, I did a bit of more research around oysters and then I found a vacancy and um, a job description. Yeah, job description at um, Australia's Oyster Coast, which was not for oyster farming, but it was to work in their factory, to grade and pack oysters. And that's mm. what I started doing. And where is that factory? In the bay, in, in yeah, Maples really? Bay, in the yeah. industrial zone. So, and I've done that and it was, it was, oh, it was hard work. It was 12 hours, sometimes 14 hours a day, standing mm. behind that belt and picking them out and then packing yeah. them. Uh, a bit of slave labor, I would say. And then after six weeks, they shut their um, they shut the factory because it was COVID nineteen, and wow. all the all their main clients were like the Sydney Opera House and hospitality, and everything had to lock and down. Yeah, and yeah. then I started surfing heaps at Mackenzie's Beach here in Malua Bay, <laughs> and I got a, uh, I became part of the community. <laughs> and you you then did a teaching. Did you do teaching training to to, to do surf school? So yeah, I um right after I came down, I didn't even even have a car, so I came down from Coffs Harbour on the bus, like an actual backpacker with my suitcase <laughs> and the surfboard. And two days after that, I booked a lesson with the surf school because I wanted to go surfing, and that mm. was with Shane from the surf school here. And yeah, I continued doing lessons with him, and then a few months after he put a job advertisement on for a surf instructor and I sent him an email and said, oh, I really want to do that. <laughs> and I oh, became really? an instructor last year. <laughs> well, I'm not Kelly Slater or anything, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's so wonderful to <laughs> yes. actually be teaching after, what, a year of surfing? Yeah, less. It was less, yeah, because I started surfing in something like October. And, um, yeah, less than a year after I, I've done my training. Mm. So how did you get the job at the Women's Refuge? What are you doing there? Um, so at the Women's Refuge, it's pretty close to my home as well. And I I actually, um, I was just thinking about going back into something legal or something. It's not comp It's not legal at all. It's more sh social oh. work. But I actually had a conversation you interviewed with Kieran, Kieran Pender. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he said like, oh, Kim, try to contact like legal aid services or like local community services. So I contacted mm. the refuge and I started there as a casual. And then they came up with a part-time contract and I have that part-time contract now there. So I'm doing after hours support. So I'm doing most of the intake, um, women flee fleeing domestic violence, going through the assessment, going through the risk assessment to see if we can accommodate them with us or if we can mm. find TA, temporary accommodation, um, referrals through counselling services, rehab. That's yeah. a very good idea because there's no community legal centre in Batman Space. No, so. there is not. Where's no. the closest community legal centre? I think Aladala. Um, Is there one yeah, in Aladala? I thought, or, or mm. Nara even. Mm. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even, Shalko's mm. legal, that's where we always refer to, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. Mm, it's pretty, it yeah. probably needs something in Batman's Bay. Yes. Would I'm, be good yeah, for. Yeah, there isn't, yeah. Maybe we can start something. We can start to it. <laughs> together. Yeah. Well, I've done, I've done. It's, yeah, it's similar than the legal aid system. I, I used to do pro bono work all the time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. In Australia, we think of pro bono as something different because legal oh, okay. aid is paid, right? It might not be paid very well, but pro bono is you do it for free. Mm. Yeah. So, yes. So yeah. it's a bit different. We actually when... call it pro, pro deo. It's Prodeo. called Prodeo, yes. But Which... it is, we get paid by the government. It's with a point system. So, for mm. example... Uh, 
uh, a divorce case has 20 points and each point represents an amount of money and you get paid two years later, which is two very, years very later. lovely. Yes. So you might as well be broke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. You don't get paid for two years. And then you get this huge amount of money and this huge amount of tax. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So it is paid quite well, but they don't it's, pay. It's less than, it's, yeah. it's, it's way less than paying clients, mm -hmm. but you get paid. Do you do get paid? And how does the legal aid system then, or the pro bono system, work in Belgium? Does it? it obviously, it's based on income. Yes. People's income. Yeah. And do they do all areas of law, or just particular areas of law? They do pretty well much all areas except of yeah mergers and acquisitions because usually mm. <laughs> those clients wouldn't get involved in yeah. that kind of procedures or yeah they they can have a business that has to be like liquidated so that that stuff can happen too but then as a lawyer you can just register with the legal aid bureau and mm -hmm. just tick which boxes ticks which yeah. um, law you want to practice and then after when you when you're in your internship you have to do a certain amount of legal aid cases to really yes to be admitted you have to do it a certain amount that's yeah. pretty good i find that good too so after mm. one after one year after passing your bar it's not the same as no. bar exams because i think we don't have bar exams yeah and it's true. you've got barrister here and solicitor for us for us it's just lawyer um but yeah mm. it's called we call it the bar, the bar it's called the bar i was admitted to the bar oh. but it's different a different terminology than yeah um, it, it covers a different value if that makes sense all right so what i'm going to do is ask you this question how do you think your law degree has helped you with your new jobs or new careers that you've had in a sense? <laughs> Yoga teacher, working in a refuge, <laughs> nanny, oyster farmer. Yeah, what well, definitely it not. Didn't really help much with the. Um, it didn't <laughs> help too oyster. much with the grading oysters. Um, although I was always very aware of my rights, <laughs> I would say, but. The, getting into yoga was more a self-care thing because mm -hmm. I really discovered like that it was too much and I had to find ways of looking after myself which was yoga for me so that is that will always be a part of my life I would say same for surfing that's just my um yeah mm -hmm. my ways of self-care and then the refuge was me feeling triggered to do something with law again because I remember the words of one of my colleagues at the law firm when I announced oh, I'm going traveling uh, and then she says I'm not we're never going to see you again but she says you will get bored because you're you're too smart to do like <laughs> other jobs you just want to be a lawyer again I think so and yeah she's it's true she, isn't she's, it? yeah I, I do feel like I want to do something with the degree again and my my grandma made a huge dram drama out of it, like, you're wasting your life and my career. Pretty well much everyone else said it was fine, what I wanted to do, because I was, I was really scared of my parents' reaction on quitting my job and going traveling. But they were fine with it because they said, like, we know you have that degree in your pocket. Now you've practiced, now you can do whatever you like. You can always go back to Belgium. Yeah. You could have always gone back to Belgium mm. too. It might have yeah. taken you a while, but... You've got the foundations. Yeah. You've practiced for five years. It's not yeah. like you haven't practiced no. at all. No. Um, but you do want to, uh, speaking to you before, you said that you are interested now in looking at practicing law in Australia. Yes. What is the process for somebody like yourself to actually practice yeah. in Australia? So I'm an overseas applicant um, and you have to go through your local, for me it's New South Wales, to, through the Legal Profession yeah. Admission Board, through mm -hmm. their procedure. So I had to fill in forms and apply for an assessment of my academic, academic qualifications and I also straight away applied for an um, assessment of PLT, I mean the equivalent then is a, my three what, yeah. years internship. And I got a decision back now that I have to study um, a certain amount of subjects. So I can either study the Diploma of Law with them or I can go to university. And I'm going to inquire now about the prices because it's 
very expensive in this country and especially for a foreign national we're not entitled to any vet loans we just have to pay the full fees and they're usually a bit more expensive as well so so it might actually cost you because did you have to pay for your degree in belgium yeah but it's it's almost nothing really it's mm. like a thousand dollars a year including mm. all the books and it's just no it's just wonderful <laughs> well you compare it here it's i think a full law degree can be 120 thousand mm. dollars i don't have to do the full degree i think i have to study about 11 subjects but that still is going to take about yeah. three years yeah something like that mm. yeah it's a lot it's it's a lot yeah it's That's, a lot but and and do you think it is it because you've come from what is called a civil law country that you have to do so many subjects yes yeah, yeah. i have to do that that's even when I was doing the assessment, so they have like their uniform principles for ex assessing mm -hmm. and I've, I've read them and I could already see like, oh, I'm just like, I'm not from the UK. I'm not from the United mm -hmm. States. Um, so I'm, I'm not from New Zealand. So it's not common law. So all the mm -hmm. other jurisdictions, they have to study that minimum amount of subject. So I kind of knew in advance what I'm signing up for. And obviously you can't <laughs> study it in Flemish. It has to no, be it has to be in English. I think my English mm. is quite all right. I have a huge accent, but it's getting mm. it's getting better. It's, it's <laughs> so really I'll be, wonderful. Yeah, I think yeah. I'll be all right <laughs> studying. And I was going to ask you, now it's interesting because already you made one good relationship on the beach in Malua Bay on Mackenzie's, Kieran Pender, who I have interviewed yeah. and who is a lawyer. But that's one of the most important things, I think, to build a good career is to build good relationships. Yeah. How do you build those? How do you build those relationships, Kimboy? Building good relationships. Well, I actually met Kieran surfing, <laughs> so we got that in common, so that was funny. Yeah, but it was really it was really cool because he, he was asking, oh, what did, what did you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm here, but I'm actually a lawyer. I'm a lawyer, <laughs> and I'm from, <laughs> I'm from overseas. So I was like, ah, oh, yeah. Well, I'm quite social <laughs> and mm. I just like, yeah, I like networking. So it's not, so yeah, what's the question again? How have no, you built just relationships? Saying, yeah, how, how have you built relationships? So you like talking to I people. I like talking and I'm, I'm, I mm. like sharing experiences because I think the most important way of learning something is from through experience mm. and you can learn so much from someone else's experience or you can be an inspiration for someone or they can inspire you so i think yeah. that's really wonderful <laughs> i think it is too um so and and the other thing that i'll before i finish this because we talked about self-care and one of the things that you said to me was that you were working 60 hours a week was that right yeah before you um decided to quit yeah. so how can we change the practice of law because i think and i was listening to something today where they were saying that a lot of women it's difficult to have children if you're if there's an expectation or have family and relationships if there's an expectation that you work 65 hours a week Personally, I think it has to change from the yeah. top and we have to start saying that this is not good enough. It's not a life for people, whether they're males or females, and you're not going to want to have, you can't juggle a really successful career if you're expected mm. to work that amount of hours. Mm. It's just not possible and a family life at home. Mm. So what do you think we should do as, or do you have any ideas about what might make the profession better for us um, in terms of self-care? What could that look like? For as a start, and I know it's hard with expectations from everyone, but you really got to learn to say no. And I think I've mm -hmm. learned that the hard way. And afterwards, I, I'm, I'm still not learning to say no, obviously, because I'm not working four jobs. But it, that's where that's where it. <laughs> that's do where, what no, I say. Yeah, do what I say, but I, I won't do it. No. <laughs> no, but it's it's yeah. But also, even the firm where you're working or the top will get a message if if they consistently get people burning out or getting sick of stress, mm. then something has to change, and you have to create a 
balance for your life. So I'm, I'm interested. I'm very tempted to be honest to go back into a law career, but I want to do it on my terms this time. And it might not work out in the, at the start because I got to do PLT and, but yeah, mm. from my past experiences, I want to um, shift things a little bit that I'm more in control. I mean, controls me, probably yeah. not to, in charge of it and also in charge of my self care. And yeah. I think working for yourself is a really good idea because you're your own boss, which creates a lot of less stress. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, Sorry. sometimes because, yeah, it's it depends. All right. So what next for for Kimberly Myart? <laughs> very good. Very good pronunciation. <laughs> I had practice before uh, what's this. What's next? <laughs> what's next for you? Well, yeah, I've got this assessment done now and I also probably have to mention this to my parents because they have, don't even have a clue what I'm up to. But oh, Actually, uh, I was going to ask you because you want to stay in Australia. So yes. how's that going to go? Because Yeah, so yeah. Right, yeah. It's, it's quite a hard visa process and now I'm going right through what my clients had to go through, like immigration clients. Mm. So it's pretty hard. Um I've done two years of working holiday visa and now I'm on a COVID temporary activity visa because I work in critical sectors that will expire um, next year. No, actually this year <laughs> in eight months. And it depends if this visa will cease to exist or not. Then I have to most likely go on a student visa. And I was figuring out like, well, if I have to study, might as well study something that I'm really mm. interested in and then doing my job in the women's refuge. I'm just getting tempted to get back into law. Yeah, I really, mm. I really hear the call again. So that will be my pathway, hopefully, to permanent residency, studying that, doing a skilled assessment, going through either state nomination or skilled visa sponsorship, all that kind of stuff. Long road, way ahead. But we'll, I'm, I... With I will the, do it. <laughs> I'll get him, there. With the amount of charm that you have <laughs> and your friendliness and your hard work, I'm sure that will be fine. Thank you. Is there anything more Thank you wanted you. to say before we finish? Um, well, just thanks for having me. And, yeah, because it's, it's, it's really nice for me to talk about, like, um, my – even if – well, it was a short career – um, to talk about my law career again and because it's I'm, I'm at that point in my life again that I'm getting tempted to do something with it so mm. I must while I, while I'm not practicing at the moment really I think I'm still a lawyer in my heart oh. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you're a lawyer in your nature too <laughs> thank you Kim for sparing the time to talk to me <laughs> If you want to find out more about Kimberly, there are show notes with each of my episodes, including contact details for each of my guests. Um, until the next time, thank you. Oh, and you can find out information on my website, www.lorettacrete.com. Please drop me a line if you have any questions or know of someone who may be interested in being interviewed for this podcast. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. <laughs>